stresses due to loaded areas. Now, whenever we talk about soil, we should understand that it's a very complex material because it involves drainage, anisotropy, non-homogeneity, etc. Though for most of the assumptions we consider soil to be homogeneous and isotropic, in actual practice it's not. It's anisotropic in nature and it's non-homogeneous. As you can see from this picture, there are different layers and different types of soil. Or even if you try to dig a hole in your ground, you'll see that each centimeter will house different kinds of soil in terms of its texture, its color, etc. So it actually is a complex material compared to any other construction material, for instance steel or to a certain extent concrete. But for analysis, we used to assume that soil is elastic, isotropic and homogeneous. Now, stresses in soil can be due to self-weight, which means its own load, or applied loads, which means any load that is coming over it, perhaps due to the foundation or perhaps due to other structures, etc. So, you can categorize stresses in soil to be contributed by self-weight and applied loads. Now, when we talk about stresses, in mechanics there are two terms Poisson's ratio and modulus of elasticity and these two terms Poisson's ratio and modulus of elasticity of soil may be found out from what we call as a triaxial test which you will study in subsequent chapters but anyways in triaxial test what we do is you prepare a soil sample which is usually of 38 millimeters in diameter and 76 millimeters in height and you test it in a special setup confining it with water and applying an axial load fundamentally you are trying to apply load and measuring the deformation so when you get load versus deformation plot you can arrive at the Young's modulus of soil and its range usually ranges from 2000 to 20,000 kilopascals not strictly within this range but this is just, just an example for us to understand the the uh, the, the probable range of uh, Young's modulus of soil and the uh, Poisson's ratio would range from let's say 0 0.2 to 0 0.5 unlike the other materials that I just mentioned steel for example soil does not exhibit the linear elastic perfect plastic kind of stress strain plot now, in stress strain plot you have axial stress in Y and axial strain in the x-axis and if you are testing soil like I said in a triaxial test setup you can't expect it to behave in a linearly elastic and perfectly plastic kind of behavior is not expected from soil uh, strictly speaking steel doesn't have that as well but still we used to assume that steel has such a behavior but as the soil doesn't exhibit that kind of a linear elastic perfectly plastic uh, stress strain plot Hooke's law may not be directly applicable to get the Young's modulus which we used to have when testing steel we used to get the we used to get the slope of the initial linear elastic portion and we represent that as the Young's modulus but in this case in soil it doesn't have a straight line portion usually so to get Young's modulus for soil, the deviator stress, which is the one that you apply axially, is plot in y axis and the strain is plot in x axis. And the initial tangent modulus and the initial secant modulus are the two options. When you don't have a straight line directly from the stress strain plot, you can go for an initial tangent modulus like this. Or an initial secant modulus or perhaps a secant modulus in general so when an initial tangent is considered for an extent of 0.5 to 0.33 of the peak deviator stress and the initial secant modulus is usually considered for 0.33 of the peak deviator stress so in this figure you can see that there's a there's an initial secant modulus taken 
by which what you do is you take the first point as the origin the second point is somewhere here and you connect a line a straight line the slope of which will be a secant modulus because you don't have a straight line in the actual plot so the initial secant modulus is usually concerned for 0.33 of the peak deviated stress 0.33 of the peak deviated stress is over here and you mark the point there connect it to the origin using a straight line and the slope of which will give you the initial secant modulus just an approximate method to get the Young's modulus when you don't have linearly elastic portion now stresses in soil like i mentioned previously can be due to the self weight which we call as geostatic stresses or it can be due to the applied loads now the geostatic stress is quite important here because the self weight is significant for geotechnical problems it may carry a major portion of the the load that governs the design for example if you have a slope and we are concerned about the failure of the slope the geostatic stress or the self weight is the most predominant one that governs the design we don't have an overburdened stress exerted by foundations the predominant load will be self weight the self weight of the soil perhaps augmented by the water pressure so anyways self weight is an important stress in terms of geotechnical engineering designs and problems now the vertical stress at a level uh, below a point is arrived at considering the weight of the soil prism this is something that we have already discussed in the previous videos you have a prism here one by one in dimension and plan and height is h and the unit weight is gamma stress at the bottom plane is gamma into h the vertical stress at the bottom plane is gamma into h marked by sigma v uh, the horizontal stress which acts laterally is found out from the vertical stress by choosing a factor called as a coefficient of lateral earth pressure again you will have to deal with these things in subsequent chapters and semesters but anyways when sigma v is equal to gamma h is a vertical stress at a plane here the horizontal stress sigma h is k times sigma v where k is a coefficient of lateral earth pressure now this was something about the geostatic stress where you didn't have an applied load the only load that gets involved in the system is the self weight gamma unit weight multiplied by the volume so in the second load condition the load is applied by not the self weight but from an external source for example if you have a point load or if you have a line load or perhaps if you have a load on a circular area or maybe a load on a rectangular area or even a load on an irregular geometry this picture shows you how the soil gets stressed when it's applied by a loading from a foundation you have the superstructure somewhere here it transfers the load to the footing the footing will transfer the load to the soil and usually this portion what we call as an influence bulb is a portion which takes the load so influence bulb is nothing but the zone in which the soil is stressed and that is stressed because you apply the load from the superstructure to the footing and it gets transferred to the soil so anyways the stress due to apply loads in general can be due to a point load can be due to a line load a circular area a rectangular area or perhaps an irregular geometry as well now when you are interested to get the point load or the stress due to point load we depend on usually the businesk equation the businesk equation gives the stress distribution in an elastic medium with the point load on the surface and just before we introduce any theory you have a set of assumptions uh, which will help us to formulate that theory even in business equation we have something 
of that soil. The assumptions in, involved are the soil is in an elastic continuum, the soil is homogeneous, the soil is isotropic, the soil is semi-infinite, and the soil is weightless. So these are a few assumptions which will help to make sure that Bosinesk equation stays strong. Uh, assume that you have the ground level here and assume that you have a load Q which of course is a point load here acting at a point here on the ground level. Now if you are interested to get the stress at a point which is Z depth below the ground level and radial distance R away from the axis and we call that point let's say point P. If you're interested to get the vertical stress at point P, Bosinesk equation can be used. So the vertical stress at point P is given by sigma ZP equal to IB multiplied by Q by Z square where Q capital Q is a point loads magnitude Z is a depth from the ground level taken vertically and IB is a term called as a Businesk factor given by this equation 3 by 2 pi into 1 by 1 plus R by Z square raised to 5 by 2 in which you have the radial distance term R. So three terms governs the stress at a vertical point P. Number one is the value of the point load at the ground level. Number two is a depth below the ground level and number three is the radial distance from the axis of the load. Uh, when you have R by Z equal to zero, which means when the radial distance is zero, IB will take a value of 0.4775. And when you have R by Z almost equal to 10, IB will take a value approximately equal to zero. And when you take a look at this equation, sigma is at P equal to IB into Q by Z square, and IB given by this equation, you can see that Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio are absent, which means the stresses will be the same for almost every linear elastic materials. And again, when you take a look at this example, this equation, you can see that at Z equal to zero, the stress will theoretically be infinite but it is not in real practice. So this is something that we can consider to be a demerit of this Busnesk equation because it comes as part of the assumption. So I used to say that demerits are nothing but the reflections of the assumptions that you make for formulating an equation. So likewise, in actual practice the stress cannot be infinite but when you substitute z equal to zero it turns out to be infinite. And another demerit perhaps is that in practice the foundation transfers load not on the ground level but at a depth. But our assumption says that the point load is applied at the ground level. And in general the Businesk equation gives conservative values and another demerit is that soil is never purely elastic and the Young's modulus E of sand increases with depth usually. So in short, a few of the assumptions that we make for business equation turns out to be some of its demerits, which a few of which are listed in this slide. Now if you have a line load instead of a point load, or if you have a strip of loading line, we'll try to see what the vertical stress at a point below it is. Now for which we have two cases. Case number one is the point is not below the center of the strip. So let's assume that there's a strip of breadth B which is equal to 2 small b or which looks like this. You have a strip like this whose width is capital B and let's assume that it's loaded by a uniformly distributed load of intensity Q and as shown in figure. Let's take a point P such that it is not below the strength of the strip instead it's 
Ray really somewhere here and let B1 or beta 1 and beta 2 be the angles subtended by these lines with respect to the axis passing through the point P. So beta 1 and beta 2 the angles made by the line connecting the ends of the strip to the point P with the vertical. Now let the angle subtended by the strip at the center of P be 2 theta as you can see from this picture. And in this geometry when 2 theta is the angle subtended by the strip at point P which is a point other than the center of the strip the vertical stress is given by sigma ZP equal to Q by pi multiplied by 2 theta plus sine 2 theta cos 2 phi and phi is given by beta 1 plus beta 2 by 2. So this equation gives the vertical stress sigma zp at a point p which is not below the center of the strip. Now let's take a case where the point p is below the center of the strip. So the geometry remains the same except for the fact that p has shifted. So the strip is of the same breadth 2B or capital B and it's loaded by the same UDL of intensity Q. So the difference here is that point P is at the center which means phi which is equal to beta 1 plus beta 2 by 2 turns out to be 0 because the first angle beta 1 is to the anti-clockwise direction and the second angle beta 2 is a clockwise direction so it turns out to be theta plus minus theta by 2 and it turns out to be 0 so the equations remains the same except for the fact that phi is equal to 0 so when you substitute phi is equal to 0 what you get is sigma zp equal to q by pi multiplied by 2 theta plus sine 2 theta. So essentially case number 1 will stay strong even for case number 2 all you have to do is to substitute phi equal to 0 which means the point P is below the center of the strip.